All right, welcome everybody to the March 9th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. As you are all aware, two things that we must abide by. Uh, the first is the antitrust policy that is currently being displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. As far as announcements, we have the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. Uh, if you have something that you would like to include in that, newsletter, please leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. The second announcement is that the Hyperledger Mentorship Program is still looking for project proposals. You have less than a week to get your project proposals in. Please, um, please do add those project proposals to the link included in the agenda. And also, um, Min is looking for one additional reviewer from the TOC to review the project proposals once they come in. Um, so I think right now we have Marcus, Rune, and Peter that have volunteered. So if she's looking for one more person, if anybody would like to volunteer, um, please let Min know. And then the last, uh, last announcement that I have is that daylight savings time begins next week in North America. Um, so next week, the for those of us who aren't changing time yet or who don't change times, this meeting is going to uh, appear at a different time on your calendar. So please be aware of that. Um, for me, I get to wake up even earlier next week. So really looking forward to next week uh, when it shows up. <laughs> uh, other announcements that anybody has that they would like to make? All right, no announcements, that's fine. Uh, so we do have some quarterly reports that are out there. Uh, I did take a look. We still have, um, for most of these, we, we cannot yet merge them. We still have at least three people who have not reviewed them. And then I don't remember which one um, only has like five reviewers. And so please, if you haven't had a chance to review, um, please do review those. As far as uh, comments or anything, questions, I didn't see anything coming up in the, the comments, but if anybody has any questions or comments on any of these reports, uh, let me know now. Okay. Uh, so then we do have two past due reports. Uh, reminders have been sent to the maintainers on March 2nd for both Grid and Transact. Um, there is some ongoing discussion in the Transact contributors channel um, with Sean asking about what sort of status this project might go into uh, such that they can do minor releases uh, whilst, while they're moving the, the code to lib sawtooth. Um, but without having to do project reports. So um, my, um, my expectation is that we may see a request coming in to move this to a dormant state in the future, but uh, Sean would like the rest of the developers, maintainers to, to weigh in on whether or not that's the, the move they wanna make. And then I uh, haven't heard anything back from Grid, um, probably worth sending another second reminder to them to the, the channel today and seeing if we can get some sort of response back from Hyperledger Grid. Any any thoughts or comments on, on those two? So Tracy, I must admit, I don't quite understand the, the motivation for the spatial status is just that they don't have to do the quarterly report. So I think I think the intention, Arno, is that Transact is going to become end of life at some point in the near future yeah. um, because they are trying to move uh, the code that was in there to LibSawtooth. Um, and so, yeah, I think they're, they're they're pretty much not doing a whole lot of work there. At the moment, um, dormant actually probably makes a whole lot of sense um, for that. But yeah, I I don't know that a uh, status change should change kind of the the reporting nature of the projects. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, I don't think, you know, producing a quarterly report for a project that doesn't do much is a pretty easy task, it seems to me. So, but okay. Either, either it's dormant and nothing happens anymore, or they're still working on it even slowly. And then producing a report doesn't seem like a very taxing activity to. Even if the report was just, we're planning on end of lifeing this soon, nothing happened. Yeah, exactly. And I did pull together this uh, list of activities on the transact star repos uh and it's pretty much been dead since i put in some change requests to retire maintainers in september so i mean there's not a lot of activity going on here i think yeah so september of 2022 was the last bunch of commits there so after that nothing Okay. Um, as far as then upcoming reports, we do have the Q1 URSA report that is due next week. Um, so we'll have to see if we can get that uh, sooner than three months out from now. Um, hopefully we can uh, get that one to come in on time or close to on time. Uh, for discussions today, I did have the task force discussion um, set up. I did also see that we have a, a new PR that's been created by Stephen on the maintainer guidelines. Um, it's not linked in the agenda, unfortunately, um, <laughs> but, uh, but it is out there. And there have been some comments on those, uh, on this particular pull request, uh, but I know that not everybody has had a chance to look at this. I think only three, um, three TOC members have had a chance to, to actually review and provide commentary, but this is something that we should uh, definitely take a look at. I think there was one item, Stephen, that you suggested maybe we could talk about in the TOC call. Is that something you want to talk about now? Um, we could. The question was whether um, adding, uh, whether a maintainer could veto the addition or or in fact, removal of a um, a maintainer on, in a repository. Um, this is text that I found in in earlier works or, or works that I based this on, and so I just left it in there. Um, I'm not sure the original source of that. Um, so, my guess would just be Daisy. I just thought it was better to have the discussion. This is the one I believe we were pointed to um, when asked to create a bunch of maintainer files. We, we um, Aries had a bunch of repos without them and we got notices um, to create them. And this was the suggested template to use. Yeah, that, blame yeah. me for that. I, I did that. Okay. Um, but so do we think vetoes are needed? I mean, I, you know, obviously, there's significant conflict if something like that comes up and and yeah my thought was what's escalation and do you take it to the toc or or where do you take it if there is that kind of um that kind of issue as opposed to you know simply a veto which didn't really say where to go after that i don't know I, you know, for me, as those others have pointed out in the in the PR, that seems a bit extreme. I mean, yeah, in an open community, you would want people to strive towards getting consensus as much as possible, and that's about as far away from it as you can be. Yeah. So I would, you know, there may be cases where some projects might decide to go that way, and we don't necessarily want to prohibit it, but I would definitely not put that in the template that we're encouraging people to use. Because I don't think, as Hart said, I don't think it's typical at all. And I don't think that's something we want to encourage. Okay. Um, what I'll do is just take another pass at that and remove that section with um, a, you know, some mention of if there's conflict. 
Um, just a matter of interest, actually, does it make sense that it, if there's conflict, it go to the TOC? Or, or do we just not reference anything? Has it ever happened that we even have to worry about it? Uh, right. I don't know if somebody else wanted to speak up, but quick comment, right? I think previously we did discuss about this where maintainers are being not responsive enough. And if the new maintainer who's being added, they do have concern with uh, the current maintainers not responding to them. I think they already know who to reach out to. And in terms of making a decision for main, for making somebody else as an additional maintainer to a given project, I think we should better leave it to the current maintainers of the project. And um, and we should let it to the project's governance itself. Right? So TOC may not have complete visibility into what goes in, mm -hmm. in out of it. Good point. Yeah, one of the things that that I tried to do in this was to separate that these um, maintainers.md files go in repositories. They're not project files, which was a lot of the wording before. So I think that that does help that you're right. The resolution of, of any sort of conflict would go to the project. Okay. Uh, yeah, in Fabric, we have had a few conflicts in terms of new maintainer proposals. And we, what we did is we just stuck to our rule, which was majority of maintainers must approve it. And sometimes we barely got over, sometimes we barely got under, but that's what we stuck with. And I, I think that's a good thing. I don't think kicking it to the TOC would help because the TOC doesn't have all the context of the project or what's going on. So I think that's fine. Good, good, thanks. All right, so I think um, what we can do obviously is leave this in the pull request uh, let people have a chance who haven't had a chance to review this yet to review it and provide their comments and feedback. Um, and then we can obviously bring this back to a future meeting for a vote uh, and to see if this is the, the direction that we're all willing to, to head with the updates, unless we can get, you know, the majority of people to vote on the PR itself. Rai, did you want to talk about what you were just displaying? Sure. Um, these are issues that I created and uh, a long time ago. And these are the, uh, the repos that are missing maintainers files. I have a job that runs once a day to grab the maintainers files. And uh, these repos have not been in compliance for a long time. I have offered and i know that uh, i don't remember the project off the top of my head uh, that these can be pointers right for the ursa stuff this could be ursa could have one maintainer file in a repo and say please see this other file and i know that fabric does that for some of the repos they say this this repo has the same maintainers as that repo and that's totally fine um i would appreciate it if I don't know. There was something else I could do other than file bugs and say, hey, guys, you're not in compliance with the uh, common repo uh, rules. So I guess I'm asking for a hand from the TOC. Alexander? Someone whose name appears here quite often with hyperledger, you don't have Python, you don't have JavaScript, you don't have iOS, et cetera. Um, the main issue that we are facing is that um, a lot of the newer repositories, that is those that are built for the Rust, you know, have version two, have maintainers files. It's just that they do not re get recognized because they're not the main file. Unfortunately, we are in a bit of a precarious situation in the sense that on the one hand, you know, have version two is not yet ready for the prime time. On the other hand, in order for every development, every change to be applicable, we kind of have to change this also for the Iroha version one and the original maintainers of that are completely gone. To the extent to which we can make some modifications but almost all of them have to be tracked and we don't even have the infrastructure to check those. Should we really 
just move on to deprecating in OHA1 and thus move the helper repositories out of those. And so the, this is the repo that you can't get stuff merged into? Um, yeah, we can get stuff merged into, and I think we added a maintainers file. Mm -hmm. If not, then um, the pull request yeah. must be hanged. Yeah, we yeah. did. It, this this repo we, wasn't on the list. Yeah, um, a lot of others were though. Yes. So and what I'm uh, saying is those other ones, you, you could just put a pointer and say, please look here. And if you can't get that merged, I can just, I can, I can merge anything in any repo. So you just tell me, merge this file and it will happen. Okay. In that case, we'll just close those issues on our side very quickly. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other discussion items before we move on to the task force discussion? Okay. Uh, then I guess Arun, it's to you. Thanks, Tracy. Hey, everyone. Good morning again and good evening. So um, previously we were discussing about, and just for the context, right? So we started discussions on having a vulnerability management team and each project nominating at least two people to this team. And we were discussing about the roles and responsibilities of what this team is supposed to do. And, and that's where we had few pointers. I don't have those notes handy with me right now, um, but I would like to continue further on that topic right so um, for today's discussion i do have five points that i would like to bring up that we as a tuc can pitch in and then create a process for ourselves here in the ipa ledger so the first point um, we'll, we'll come back to the roles and responsibility of the vmt right as part of some of these points that i'm going to bring up today but for today's discussion let's discuss the first point which is related to um, the association of hyperledger with the CV numbering authorities, right? So um, let's assume for a time being that in one of the issue that is reported is indeed a vulnerability that has to be addressed. And now as a hyperledger foundation, we, um, we may need to recommend those people who re report those issues a security issue um, and then we may need to work with them in creating um, a cv uh, number right and these numbers are issued by uh, these agencies or authorities i don't think so hyperledger foundation has that authority i think hart mentioned that some time ago but we can work with some of these authorities and and um create those right um so that's one of the open item that we so, can discuss. Mm -hmm. Arun, um, so we do, Hart is correct, we do not have a, a, the authority to issue those. However, we have been issuing them through HackerOne and GitHub. So we can get them issued for issues in GitHub. I do want to also bring out the, the point that when we report the vulnerabilities to these authorities, I think they go through a set of questionnaire. And when we answer those questions, it assigns a score against the issue that we have reported. And this score uh, tends to say how severe is the issue. And um, yeah. Art? Oh, sure. I was just going to ask a question on the CVE stuff. Um, do we want to still sort of have the thing where Hyperledger, you know, causes or, you know, does the CVE process or do we want, uh, you know, do we want to make it more so that projects can sort of handle this for themselves? I know there are some cases where, uh, you know, where it might be, it sort of has to be out of Hyperledger, uh, but there's, 
as someone brings up the Besu <laughs> at GitHub. Uh, but you know, most of them are done like through Hyperledger at this point, uh, except for the ones that come in through Ethereum. Uh, so I just don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Like, are you happy with what's going on right now with the CVEs or do you want something more flexible? David? Uh, I can tell you for one of the fabric security vulnerabilities, we opened a GitHub advisory and there was also a hacker one report and we ended up with two CVEs and they were duplicates of each other. It caused a little bit of confusion. So it'd be really nice to pick one or the other as the preferred approach instead of both. So I guess, do you want us to state that in policy that one should be preferred or do you want to pick yourself? I think we could define that as a policy at the TOC here. Okay. I don't really have a preference. I would just like us to decide on one or the other. Yeah. I think GitHub is much better uh, in terms of our ability to, we can issue a CVE against any repo. I can't imagine a time where we would need to issue a CVE from hacker one that we couldn't also issue from uh github peter if you're going to pick one then i will give a plus one to github okay so maybe we say we'll say in the default policy it should be github but you know if you have a good reason for it not to be github that's probably okay too and my thought is that like um, so of the base use stuff in particular, right? Some of the the bugs and security reports come in through different intakes. They might come in through like an Ethereum wide intake. And so the base use community might not have control over where the CVE, you know, or over who handles the CVE. So the um, thanks, Hart, and 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 for the con continuing on the same topic, right? So at the foundation level, do you think we need to have a, uh, uh, let's say a sync with uh, a team on this on the GitHub in case we choose that as a preferred partner uh, for issuing all the CVs and have that access with them in case something needs to be edited or updated like I, I, at the foundation level no i mean i think that already basically works right i don't think there's anything we need to do with that right so as i understand some of these some of the times when the cv is created like the creator has access to it and then creator sets the policy and we as the foundation we get very little to be involved over there in case we want to moderate any of those from publicly getting disclosed until some point in time let's say let's say somebody reports an issue and we set our guidelines saying that, hey, give us 90 days of time and then we'll, we'll come back to this. We'll make sure this issue gets fixed or we'll address your concerns as soon as possible. But it's at the best effort of us, right? And we do not really have control over whether that, if, if it's really critical and then if it, in case it gets disclosed in public forum. Yeah, well, I mean, we, no one can really do anything, right? If you're, uh if your vulnerabilities are publicly disclosed by the finder, right? I mean, that's that's just sort of a, you do your best with what you can, right? You wanna encourage those people not to do that, but you know, if they do, there's nothing really you can do about it. Any other thoughts and comments on that? So, uh, yeah, Peter. 
Yeah, I just agree with Hart. Uh, we don't control who does the disclosure if, if they do disclose it. I don't know how often does it happen that security researchers don't hold to that standard 60 or 90 days of grace period, but if if we just get unlucky and someone finds something who does not care about that for whatever reason, then there's there's basically nothing we can do about that. Okay, okay. so I'll, in the proposal, I'll put that um, we do prefer GitHub, but in case you are disclosing in, through other means or through other authorities, we still welcome that. That's good. Um, okay, the next point that I wanted to bring up is with respect to the em embargo list. So this is a list of people who would who would be given early access to the vulnerabilities that are reported. And um, the OpenSSF recommendation is that for for those projects which are widely adopted, which which would affect a wide range of users, which we already know of. At least for those projects, we strongly recommend having an embargo list where the service providers are informed. Um, let's say somebody is providing uh, managed blockchain as an offering so to other partners. And then whoever is using their platform would be impacted if this vulnerability gets disclosed. So um, the OpenSSF recommendation is to work with those uh, vendors or those partners and make sure they are given early access and they are informed about this vulnerability. But it does come with certain risks associated. For instance, uh, this may be conceived, um, uh, conceived as a thing where, let's say, a foundation is giving preference to certain organizations over others. Or maybe it may be perceived as um, the um, early access embargo list. Those people may have, I mean, since, since everybody else is under uh, the the uh, they, they they do know about the process. They understand the risks associated with uh, disclosure in public forum, but the embargo list can sometimes grow very big. And if there is possibility that the information that is shared across may publicly be visible sooner than what we expect it to be, um, so it's like more people knowing the secret will lead to much more of them knowing about it. Right. And um, the other risks associated with it are um, the, let's say once the issue is identified and we eventually found out that the fix for it may take longer time or maybe um, the, the um, like the consumers, they are already be um, um, like exposed to that vulnerability. Now the embargo list has have little to do and they may be at a risk and they may uh, have a bad impression of the project itself which they are providing as a service right so uh, there is risk associated with it in multiple ways so any thoughts on the embargo list itself or any of these risks that are associated with it I know we can we can actually reference some of the projects that we have and uh, correlate them. I know some of the uh, some of the projects that are widely adopted could be, for instance, Aries Fabric and Vesu, right? Um, Bevel. So. so yeah, I really second Arun's point here. Um, I'd be curious what people here thought about embargo lists. In my experience, um, and this is in a different life, they typically work pretty well because we are all on the same page. But um, there, someone can break the embargo. When the change goes in, a lot of smart people are going to diff every change and see if there's anything uh, exploitable there. You can just look at like the Windows updates when they come out; they're reverse engineered in hours. So I, I, I think it's worth having, um, but you have to realize that people have different desires and they're gonna do what they're gonna do.
absolutely. Um, so it's maintainers on here. What do you think about embargo lists? Dave. Dave. Yeah, I definitely think giving vendors early access to a disclosure is a good idea. I think the benefits outweigh the risks. Is is that what an embargo list is, basically? Yeah, basically, you just have a list of people that you know that use your project at some level, right? And you basically, uh, you know, typically you would nebulously notify them of that, you know, like this is a, there's a huge bug coming up, be ready to update or something like that, right? Or, you know, you can say, it, uh, <clears throat> there's not necessarily a lot of consistency in what you tell people early, but it's just generally you tell them early, that there's a security vulnerability to be prepared. Yeah, my, my opinion is the benefits outweigh the risks. Awesome. Okay. Does anybody else have thoughts on this? Peter? I agree. But I will also say that me personally, I will only add people to that list whom I know, uh, at least to some extent, because I would be worried that someone just uh, spoofs the identity of some company and they get on the embargo list actually to get uh, the information that they need to then exploit the vulnerabilities. So it would have to be somehow verified and the only thing I can think of right now is that if I if I've met you, then I can add you to the embargo list. Otherwise, uh, no. But I know that's a little bit on the paranoid end of things. I don't think that's too paranoid. That's usually the strategy that a lot of big companies take. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Then I I support it, and this would be my personal preference of actually handling who gets on. Thanks, Peter. Hi, Steve. Um, so would the, would the mechanism for implementing such a thing be simply that that is the, that is the set of people invited to see the security um, issue on GitHub? Is that no. the way you would implement that? No, this would be like an email list or something. Uh, generally, you're probably not going to share the full security issue. Um, so you're, you're probably going to share some information with these folks, but not complete information. So we, either we as a TUC or the project teams, we can recommend projects to come up with list of templates. For instance, if anything, so uh, as part of the vulnerability disclosure, right? So when the issue gets reported, I'm sure like before it is considered as a security risk, somebody must have analyzed it and they would know the severity of, of that issue. And uh, when a CVE gets assigned, I think it's that's that's the time when we disclose this information to embargo list. And um, it could be at thought level, we as a TUC can recommend a list of templates with minimum information that we would like all the embargo list to be known. And then we can let project teams decide upon um, what additional information they would like to share about that um, issue. Tracy? Is the embargo list per project or is it per hyperledger, right? So is it for the foundation or is it per project they get to decide who the embargo list is? Uh, I'll so, jump. Go ahead, Arun. No, no, go on, Art. I would just uh, say it would be at the project, but yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to do it on a project by project basis, right? If I'm not a Fabric user, right, I don't really need to know information on Fabric security bugs, right? No, I think that's good, but I think we just have to be very specific there. Um, yeah. I think that's the right answer. It's just I wasn't getting that out of the conversation, and I wanted to make sure that that was very specific in what we were documenting. So, yeah, so I think the, the goal is that we're documenting a template for each project to have, right? So each project is going to be able to customize a little bit. And one of the big things that they will, you know, be able to customize, obviously, is who is, is on their particular embargo list. Great. Stephen? 
So how is an embargo list implemented? How does, like, is it a embargo.md file in your repository or? Um, I, I'm just struggling with that part. Yeah, so I mean, in theory, it's just an email list. Uh, there may be some uh, privacy concerns. So, um, you know, it may end up being like a maintainer only thing. Uh, but I think that's, again, up to the project. I think some projects, people are going to be comfortable with that being public and some might not. I agree. I second heart. So I think one of the risks that comes with embargo list is if, let's say, organization A knows about organization B and like both of them have early access to the vulnerability. I don't know if the competition leads them to malpractice. Right? So we can give benefit of that doubt and probably it's better to have that access uh, hidden uh, or at least the information hidden about who is part of the embargo list. But we should disclose the information saying that there is an embargo list with all the major service providers. And if you are not on that list do reach out to let's say a contact person either from the project or at the foundation level so that we can we can add we can think of whether to consider you to that list uh, when i say we i'm intending to say either uh, if it is something that we can determine at the toc level or at the project level um i saw peter raising hand so peter uh, yeah, uh, you and Hard pretty much said everything I wanted to say. I wouldn't mind having uh, it documented that the list exists, but I would definitely not want it public who's on the list because then they could just become targets for spoofing and uh, all sorts of other things. Yeah, if the list exists, it absolutely the the existence of the list absolutely needs to be public, right? That's yeah. just best open source practices. But whether or not like you know, uh, whether the list itself is public is a whole other thing, right? You know, if I find a bug and there's an embargo list public, you know, if I'm a black hat hacker, well, now I know what to do with my bug, right? Um, so, yeah. So any other thoughts or comments on the embargo list before we put it in a proposal? Um, so just generally speaking, I think uh, people are in favor of embargo lists. Uh, do we want them to be, uh, you know, do we still want them to be optional? Anybody? Peter, my Steven? Two, my two cents is that they have to be. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, for some projects, I'm not sure who would even, you know, that I'm related to, I don't even know who would be on that. So um, I don't think they can be required. Yeah, well, the general thing is uh, people, you, you don't, you know, you make people tell you. So people are only on the list if they tell you they want to be on the yeah. list. So, okay. You know, list participant discovery is not a not necessarily a big thing. Um, it's you know that's on the people, that's not on you. Okay. It's just a matter of whether you think the pro you know can you handle like you know it's does the pro like should we require projects to do this like extra step of notification basically? And we could say it's optional. You know, we could say you know graduated projects have to have it. You know, all, there, there's there's lots of gradations here, right? You know, no one's going to expect labs to have to have you know <laughs> embargo lists, right? Uh, Peter, plus one for optional. I ideally, I would say this is a must-have, but. Uh... If, if what what we see in practice is that some projects struggle to to keep up with quarterly reports as well, so I think adding just more 
mandatory burden would not help. Thanks, Peter. David? Yeah, I would just use the word recommended. I like that, and that's going in the document draft. Thanks, Dave. So um, the, the connected question to that, I think we kind of gave an indication that it should be project team who decides to who can go into embargo list. Is that what we are also agreeing upon? Just for confirmation. And we provide a means for somebody to pitch in saying that they can be on the embargo list. David? I'd say it probably makes sense to have, if we have two contacts per project, it probably makes sense for those two to manage the embargo list. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's the security team that manages it. Okay. Um, so the uh, the open SSF recommendation was that VMT, uh, the, the vulnerability management team would come into picture to decide who can go into embargo list, but we could um, we could set up that uh, the escalation procedure for somebody, right? So, uh, let's say if I would like to be interested in the embargo list for a specific project, I'll go to that project and ask them, "Hey, since we are the largest consumer of this project, please keep me informed about anything that you disclose." And then, if the project team doesn't agree, then I can go to VMT and request them that hey, I did request this, but they did not approve. What do you think of it? Or maybe the next step could be come to TOC. Okay. Um, yeah, Tracy. I feel like if the team says no, um then the team says no right like if a project thinks that they shouldn't get it then um there's a reason there and why why would we have the ability for somebody to to override the the project i don't know i mean it doesn't seem to make sense to me but there could be a reason that i'm not seeing Any thoughts from anybody? I cannot think of a reason. And the only reason I can think of is that just the security team might not know the extent of who's using the project, but I think this should be relatively easy to document. Like you should be able to convince people that you're using the project, right? It makes sense to me, Hart. I think that if uh, if somebody's using the project, you should either know that right off the bat, or they should be able to prove to you how they're using it. And and I just I guess I'm thinking that if they can't do that, and the team says no, then the team says no, right? Or the project says no. Um, it just seems to make sense to me. Thanks, Lucy. Peter. Yeah, if if they are a major user of the project, then chances are you've ran into them at a global forum or, or a meetup or anything else before. Makes sense. All right, um, so moving on to the next part. I know we already may have uh, some something put up on this particular part of, of the proposal. So this is related to the process itself. So, so far we have been talking about having a VMT and then what their roles and responsibilities are, and then how the scoring can be issued to a reported um, vulnerability and who gets early access to all of this. But now all of this information 
um, are are um, they are like the process that we have to follow, our maintainers have to follow. The what's not uh, publicly visible is the process that will be followed when an issue is reported. Let's say if I'm a security researcher, I come here, I identify an issue. What's the next thing that's going to happen when I report an issue? I have no visibility into that, right? So most of these discussions do happen among the maintainers and the reporter. But um, I would like to know what would happen in, let's say, five days of time, maybe 10 days of time. Or maybe, um, like, what's the next thing? Who will be informed about this? What should I do later? At, let's say at the 90th, 90th day, right? Um, so this process, I know there is a Confluence page. I don't have the link handy, but we do have uh, that information mentioned somewhere. Maybe uh, what we can do in addition to that is put a link to that Confluence in all our security MD file and say, uh, tell it to somebody who is coming and reporting a security issue that, hey, in case your issue gets um, accepted as a CVE, with the with the scores, and this is the process that we follow. And here's the link to that process, and expect to, um, I mean, expect us to do these activities at this point in time, and then do reach out if in case you feel it's not going as per schedule. Right. Um, I don't have the link handy. Sorry for that. I wish I had my laptop with me, but. Uh, Rai, I'm not sure if you have the link handy to share it. I, uh, which link are you talking about? The security response link, right? So the recommendation is to put link to the, I mean that link in each repository security MD file if we already don't have it in it. so that the reporter would know the process that is involved. Right, so I was referring to the security bug handling process that is listed over here. Yeah, we can uh, we can make that public, and we can probably also clean that up a little bit. It um, it are it is this is public. Um, it's it is hard to find. It should be linked in most of the security.md files. I was looking at this for some other reason, um, and I think that like Fabric had it. Uh, yeah, we definitely link to it. This this might also be uh, a chance to this this document might live in the uh, uh, in the governance repo. Yeah, that's my that is the point. I think. Okay, so I, I'm fine with that. Okay. I think all of this, I think we should have a, probably a, a sub repo uh, for security in the governance repo, but. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Just like a subfolder for security policies. Sure. Make one. <laughs> okay. File a PR, I'll, I'll merge it. <laughs> Are we saying, to, sorry, I, I didn't get that. Are you suggesting that we create a repository and maintain list of all the security related policies under that? Yeah, so I'm just suggesting that like this, if you're coming from the TOC website, this kind of stuff is hard to find right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just suggesting that we move some of this stuff to the project governance folder. Okay. And yeah, we, we don't have to do this today, but in general, do people feel okay with this? Yeah, 
Yes. Yeah, I have no reason to do it. So I think I think moving it to GitHub is fine. I guess the question is, does it does it fall under Hyperledger governance or does it fall under Hyperledger TOC? TOC, right? Sure. I I I was speaking of governance earlier because it was on my mind. I don't have a feeling about it. it it's a TOC policy, so let's go there. Cool. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes left, uh, but there are a couple other security things that I wanted to poll people about, if that's okay, and just get some general thoughts. Sure, yeah. I don't think so. I can bring up two other points that I had in my notes. They are longer discussion items. Go ahead. No, no, no. But bring them up. They Go ahead. No, let's go with the ones that you have, because these may take longer time. It's fine. We should just bring them up anyway, if they're going to take a longer time. So, so please. <laughs> so I wanted to review as part of this task force, the current process that we have and make sure that we cover uh, at least these seven points that I have noted down. Uh, those correspond to the acknowledgement to every issue that is reported. I know many of the times there is a possibility that uh, as a reporter, I may, I may be in a, and, and I may be motivated to report a security bug than reporting that it as a normal issue, right? A normal bug. So um, it is important that we acknowledge each of the issue that is reported and the onus is on the VMT. Uh, representatives of that project, or at least identify somebody else who can be res who can respond to this, or at least acknowledge saying that we have received your request. And in case, I mean, whether it's accepted as a vulnerability or it's just an issue, it's important that we inform it to the, uh, the somebody who has disclosed it. And if the project team decides that it's a it's an um, it's just an issue that can be disclosed publicly without withholding any additional information, and it's it's fine to be disclosed in open forum. They should be able to um, just create an issue out of it and then say, "Hey, now we have considered this as an issue, and we'll fix it based on the priority of the project." Right? And um, yeah, the acknowledgement and the response back to the reporter is very critical. And it should be done irrespective of how many issues are being reported. And um, it's also important that we cover the embargo list information with the, with the person who is disclosing the issue or who is creating the issue so that they know about um, the additional people being informed about it, right? And there may be a negotiation period or uh, negotiation that could happen with the person who is disclosing. If they do not wish, uh, and so we should make this as an optional right for them. If I, as a reporter, I do not want embargo list to be notified about the issue, then it should not be. So the, the whether to be disclosed to embargo list or not is, should be given as a choice to the person who's disclosing it. And um, we should also make sure that we do inform the person who's disclosing about the patch information when it comes up. And um, I mean, we, we can work with uh, the person who's disclosing to get them a CV number assigned to their issue. Um, right, so, and, and we can also work with them for the release date, but it's not mandatory uh, that we need their approvals, but it's good to be, it's good to inform them about the release in which the issue will be, um, fixed and finally we need to work with the person who's disclosing a, a date um, on which they can publicly disclose that information i want to make sure that we capture these points in our list the security bug handling process Right, so Hart, I think that may require us to probably go through each of these points and then see if which of this is missing. Yeah, we can go through these point by point. 
Um, I also had questions. Um, is anyone using, or, or, or well, I should ask, what are people's thoughts on uh, private patch development infrastructure? Um, if anyone wanted to share on that. And then I also wanted to solicit feedback on what people thought about GitHub security advisories. I know we have two minutes left, so if anyone wants to get in a quick uh, sentence or two, that'd be great, or otherwise we can table this for a future time. Tracy? What What is private patch disclosure infrastructure? Is that Development what you infrastructure, it? private Development patch. Infrastructure. Yeah, what is it? Uh, so it's basically just uh, a private fork develop, you know, used to develop security bug fixes, right? So most of the time when you do open source development, you do it out in the open. But if you're fixing a critical security bug, you might want to do it with a very limited visibility, right? So that's okay. all that what that is. So that's how it's done with GitHub. When you create a security uh, vulnerability, it creates a private repo that mm -hmm. the researchers added to. Um, so that's that's the way it works right now on GitHub. That's right. Sounds like a good thing. So basically, I'm just curious if uh, if everyone is happy with that, and we should just tell people to use that just do it in github how, do, how does it actually work logistically because eventually it has to get it has to go into your main branch for um to release from right yeah uh, so once once the uh code is merged uh the the repo where the development was done gets deleted so if you want David, uh, when we're not on a recorded call, I can show you some stuff that's under development, some security vulnerabilities are under development, and I'll show you how it works logistically. Okay. I think it makes sense in theory, as long as the logistics work out okay. Yep. Uh, Peter? It's a plus one from me. Uh, I think we should also use the word recommended here. If someone has their own thing for whatever reason, if, if they actually want to put in the work to, to create their own environment for this, then they should be able to. But, uh, but also we should definitely help people by saying, yes, we recommend the, the feature that GitHub has because it's convenient. Okay. Thanks. And um, then I, your last question on security advisories. I like it. Is there anything not to like about it in GitHub? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I was asking you all that. I've had good experiences with it. I just wanted to make sure that I, my opinion was not out of line with everyone else's. I think it's better to bring this topic again in next week. And I know we are on top of our top of the hour, but one more last item I want to also bring up and maybe people can think through until the next week is we uh, we need a way to uh, monitor these, whether like all the projects are following the process set up for the security. And this becomes very critical for from a governance standpoint. So we need to think of a mechanism to govern these things. And I know most of these we cannot just ask them to be re ask them to report it in the quarterly reports, but we need to find out the mechanism or come up with a mechanism. Victor. So uh, how about we have a checklist and uh, we uh, one moment. So how about we implement an actual checklist and everyone reports uh, something like a quarterly report so we can integrate all this information into some page and actually check what is done and in which comments it was done. What do you think about that? 
let's take this up in next week's discussion sorry but yeah point considered all right so thanks everybody for the discussion today uh we will be meeting again next week so until then thanks a lot